Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Thanks so much for being, being with us today for this webinar featuring Sheila Smith. Sheila is a Senior Fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And joining Sheila for this conversation is our good friend, Laura Young, here in Dallas. This webinar is presented in partnership with the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. I especially want to take a moment to thank and welcome customers of Interabang. That's our Dallas independent bookstore. And they are offering right now a very special, special uh, promotion for listeners of this uh, webinar, as well as members of the World Affairs Council. You can order Sheila's book. In fact, you can order any book through Sunday and get a 15% discount. And I promise you they'll get it out the door just as quickly as possible. Again, that's interabangbooks.com and you can get that 15% discount uh, through Sunday. These are challenging times for organizations and individuals. And for those of you who are enjoying listening and watching these webinars, I hope that you will consider making a donation to support them. You can do that by going to our website at the World Affairs Council and that is dfwworld.org forward slash donate. And we certainly appreciate your support. And uh, so many people have been sending in contributions over the course of the last few days. And uh, just let me say that on behalf of our staff and our board of directors, we really, really appreciate it. Let me tell you about Sheila Smith. As I said, she's a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Her new book, uh, which came out uh, last year, is called Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power. She's been a visiting researcher at leading Japanese uh, foreign and security policy think tanks. And uh, she's participated in a number of uh, important exchange panels and teaches now at Georgetown University. Uh, moderating today's conversation is Laurie Young. And Laurie is the director of uh, competitive intelligence at Lone Star. That's a firm uh, here in Addison, Texas. Uh, that's about 10 miles away from downtown Dallas. Uh, she's been in this type of field, competitive intelligence, uh, for 30 years. Laurie, it's all yours now. I look forward to listening to your conversation. Thanks again for being with us. Jim, thank you so much for the opportunity. Sheila, I look forward to learning more. Uh, first of all, I'm very interested in, in why did you select Japan for your focus and, and, your, and your academic studies. Well, thank you, Lori and Jim both for having me. It's a delight to be in Dallas, even if it's virtual. <laughs> um, so I, I am a Japan you know, scholar. I studied at Columbia University. I got my PhD, but the bug that, that, that really bit me was I had a chance to go to Japan and um, study Japanese at a university in Tokyo. And there I studied Zen Buddhism and culture as well as the language. And so I, I stayed with the Japanese family and I really quite fell in love with the society. It was intriguing and fascinating. Um, and from that is where my professional interests grew. So are you also fluent in Japanese? Because I understand that's a very difficult language to learn and write, especially. It is. And um, I have a 20 year old currently in, in college who is struggling through second year Japanese. <laughs> so it is a tough language, but it is certainly worth a, a, the investment of, of learning it. But yes, I do speak Japanese. I always hesitate to say I'm fluent because I think all of us are, are uh, still in study mode when we're working with a language like Japanese. Why don't you tell our listeners what your book is about? I, I read it and, and found it absolutely fascinating in terms of current affairs, in terms of what's going on with China. Um, it's, it's especially relevant now. Uh, give people an idea of the, the, about your book. Great. I'm happy to. And, and again, thank you to the independent bookstore there in Dallas to, to make the offer to make it available. I love independent bookstores, so I hope you'll certainly take them up on that offer. Um, so Japan Rearmed came out of, I would say, decades of my interest in thinking about the Japanese military. As everybody knows, Japan has a very unique constitution in which Article 9 says that the Japanese people forever renounce uh, the use of military force to settle international disputes. Um, that article, of course, was incorporated into the Constitution under the U.S. occupation. Uh, General MacArthur was very intent on pacifying Japan after the war. Um, it was also 
part and parcel of a larger global debate about collective security and about negotiating instead of fighting wars. And this was, of course, the conversation that was going on surrounding the United Nations. Um, Japan is an ad, uh, a, a very strong supporter of collective security and negotiated dispute resolution and has been a strong supporter of the United Nations. So the, the, the place of the Japanese military and Japanese post-war foreign policy has been very different than in the pre-war. And the counterbalance to that, of course, is Japan emerged uh, into this post-war period when the Cold War had already started and Japan signed a peace treaty with the United States and, and 30 some other countries, but also concluded a bilateral security treaty that remains in force today. And under that treaty, the United States uh, offers strategic protection, nuclear deterrence for Japan, but also our military in Japan works very, very closely with the Japanese military. So there's the push and the pull of Article 9, but the, the pull a little bit of the, the regional uh, balance, military balance, and the role that Japan plays in the alliance with the United States in Asia. What about the evolution of Japan from a quote unquote checkbook power during Gulf War I to an active participant in peacekeeping and, and actually putting their forces a little bit more in harm's way over time? Sure. So the book does cover the post war, uh, the post Cold War period, and I begin uh, it with a chapter that looks at how Japanese thinking about its military as an instrument of uh, international cooperation has changed, and it started right there, as you said, uh, in the first Gulf War, 1990-91. Japan did not send troops, although the U.S. ambassador at the time. Uh, was a very vocal, outspoken advocate of Japan reconsidering its limitations on its self-defense force so that it could work in coalition with the United States and other partners there. But what began in that debate, very heated debate, and the criticism of being a checkbook power um, really led to a fairly substantial internal conversation inside Japan inside the government itself, but also among the government and among the Japanese people about, so how do we cooperate with others with similar interests in maintaining peace and security around the globe? And Japan, right, by that time in 1990, of course, was a, a substantial economic power. Uh, and a lot of countries were looking to Japan, including the United States, to play a larger role globally. So that was the kickoff point. Today, uh, Japanese self-defense forces participate in UN peacekeeping uh, around the globe in very, sometimes in very dangerous places. Uh, they work very Let closely. Let me interrupt just for a second, if sure. I may. Uh, I see that we're not getting a very good picture and I just want to apologize to our viewers. We'll go with this as long as we can and I think people are able to hear you, but it's very choppy and I'm hearing that from some of our viewers uh, around, the, around the country, but continue. So I'm not sure technically what we could do to fix that, Jim, but I will certainly, I mean, our, I, I don't see any choppiness on my end, so I'm not sure. Yeah, there's really what nothing do. we can do about it unless we okay. uh, uh, get rescheduled. So let's keep going and hopefully it'll okay. clear up. Thank you. Okay. For your patience. All right. Thank, thank you. So I'll just try to to, to speak in smaller bites. Um, I, the, what the the role of the Japanese military around the Indo-Pacific today is, I think, what many um, people are focused on, and that is not only with us, but with partners in Australia, uh, India. Uh, Japan's military works very closely with the maritime nations of Southeast Asia, and that includes uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and to a certain degree, some of the smaller countries. So I think Japan's military today is, is far more welcome around the region and a far greater participant in not only global but regional military affairs. So in your book, you talk about how Japan does not identify China as a threat, yet they are absolutely paranoid of every time North Korea tests and they shoot something into the Sea of Japan. How does that, how does that balance out with the, the current world posture? So I hope I don't say China is not a threat <laughs> in the book, but China is indeed, I think, the largest strategic challenge for Japan, and that may be a slightly different language, but the, the increase in Chinese military power has certainly put a lot of pressure on Japan's defenses, 
the Chinese activities in and around the sea and airspace of Japan has only increased not only in, in terms of quantitative presence, the more and more ships, more and more aircraft, but also the quality of, Jap of Chinese uh, military capability has improved significantly over the last decade. So this is a, you're looking at a slide now that's from the Ministry of, of Defense in Japan and it's chronicling recent activities. Um, but you can see, and you can see from the perspective of that slide, it's looking out from continental Asia. And often when we look at pictures or maps of Japan, we look across the Western Pacific towards Japan. But this is really helping you get a perspective of how uh, ja the Japanese archipelagic, ar archipelagic position geographically affects Chinese planning and Chinese military activities. It is in some ways a barrier to the egress of the Chinese Navy to the Western Pacific. So you see an awful lot of activity there. Increasingly, you also see activity of, by the Chinese military and the Russian military combined. So they do joint exercises now, both air patrols and some naval patrols through the East China Sea and very close to Japanese borders. So I have a question from Christopher, and I apologize if I screw up your name, Ingolito. Uh, is Japan still content with US's nuclear umbrella or does it view the Chinese North Korean threat enough incentive to amend its constitution to allow its own rearmament and military expansion geographically? So Christopher, that, the, the concluding chapter of my book really tries to look ahead to say, what are the changes that we could anticipate? What variables would affect uh, the Japanese strategy of developing their own national military capability, but staying as a non-nuclear power, right? Also not acquiring significant offensive strike capability, even in the conventional sense. So they don't develop long range ballistic missiles or they have not yet developed those missiles. Um, and that is because they can rely on the strategic protection of the United States. The United States is the, is the spear, so to speak. It has the offensive strike capability. And of course, there's two places that that matters and most obviously in North Korea. Um, as you can see on the slide here in 2017, just to remind our listeners um, that the, the testing by North Korea in 2017, when President Trump had first come into office and we had a very tense situation between North Korea and the United States. Um, if you'll look at all of those missiles that were launched, both the short range and the medium range, and even the testing of those intercontinental ballistic missiles that were designed to demonstrate their ability to reach the United States, um, they all flew towards or over Japanese territory. Japan has an extensive investment in ballistic missile defense systems. So that is designed to track and identify and track and if necessary, shoot down uh, incoming missiles. But at the, at the frequency with which these uh, missiles are launched, and if we were in a wartime situation, those missiles would be incoming in multiple numbers of missiles at the same time, then ballistic missile defenses are not an absolute defense against incoming missiles. So North Korean missile capability, as well as its nascent nuclear capability are a deep concern to Japan and our deterrent and our ability to help defend Japan should, that, uh, should there be conflict with North Korea is really critical to their security. Uh, Raymond Termini is asking if Japan has a plan B to re on its reliance to the U.S. for military protection, in your opinion. So this is linked to the, the final push of Christopher's earlier question. Um, the United States, I think, has never, de never suggested that it was not willing to offer strategic protection to the United States. Um, but we are in a slightly different era. Uh, there, our president has said numerous times, not only to our Asian allies, but to NATO as well, that he's willing to reconsider Article 5 protections to our allies. Um, that, you know, caused some quiet consternation in Tokyo, as well as in Seoul and in, in the NATO capitals. I think, should the United States decide it was no longer willing to offer strategic pr protection, or if we decided that we were going to charge a lot of money, which is what we see in the US-South Korean conversation at the moment, at the moment um, you could see various factors here influence the thinking of Japanese about the reliability of the United States. But the plan B is nowhere to be seen. Um, it is not an option that Japan wants to pursue. I think a lot of people fast forward to, oh, Japan would go nuclear. 
I happen to believe it would take more than that for Japan to, to, to acquire a nuclear arsenal. And there's reasons for that we can talk about if you're interested. But I think the plan B is always been partly a hedge for Japan, and that is to intensify and expand its regional cooperation. Um, that is uh, part of what's behind the in increased strategic dialogue with Australia. Uh, I think you're collective a collective response to the rise of china for example is would be japan's preferred option but the alliance is first and foremost japan's priority so i have a question from raymond termini um sorry not raymond steve stephanie she's interested about the japanese and russian relationships with regard to the kuril islands and then the the tensions that exist there it's a great question, Stephanie. I think um, we've watched Prime Minister Abe since he came back into office in late 2012, really go uh, wholeheartedly in, in an effort to try to create a relationship with Vladimir Putin, uh, to try to make sure that there's a dialogue on those Northern territories, but most importantly, that, that there's a strategic understanding between Japan and the, the, and the Russians to the North. And that strategic understanding is Abe would really really like to dissuade Russia and China from ganging up on Japan in the region. And so providing an alternative partner, uh, a constructive alternative partner with economic development funds, perhaps for the Far East, for other kinds of uh, dialogues. I think that was really what Abe was trying to do. So far, uh, President Putin has not been willing to compromise on the Kirils. And so what you see, despite that diplomacy, and it's a tricky one for Mr. Abe because I think expectations were quite high that he would succeed. Uh, but uh, you also, despite this diplomacy at the highest level of the two governments, you've also seen the military continue to put um, test Japanese defenses up north. We get very focused these days on Japan's response to China, but we should re remind um, everyone that Japan's Air Force in particular continues to have a significant um, challenge to the north in the form of the Russian Air Force. So we have an anonymous uh, person who's saying hello from a fellow Columbia alum. What is your perspective on the internal political obstacles in Japan toward rearmament how, how strong are the political uh, feelings against rearmament? So I think they're very strong. And I, 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 since this is a Columbia alum, that, that person um, undoubtedly is familiar with the Japanese public's reticence uh, about a revising Article 9 of the Constitution, which Mr. Abe said he'd like to do, um, but also relying st strongly on the military as an instrument of Japanese uh, foreign policy. I think even though there's been significant change, uh, that's the change that I document in the book, um, the Japanese public is not uh, anxious to turn Japan into a full-fledged normal power is the language, right? In which military power is, or the military instrument is seen just as uh, uh, significant as economic power. So you had, a, a, and there are there's a lovely slide there to show you. Uh, in 2014, the Abe cabinet reinterpreted Article 9 to say the Japanese Self-Defense Force should be able to work with other national militaries. That would be the United States military, obviously, but also with Australia, with others in the region, if necessary, and could use force in coalition if it was uh, involving Japanese security. Uh, the following year, the, the government put legislation in front of the Japanese diet uh, to approve this, uh, the ways in which this would affect Japanese military planning. And that was a result, you see that in that slide. So tens of thousands of Japanese gathered in front of the diet, which is the building in the foreground. Um, and these were generate these were people who were older people who had uh, experience in the war. Uh, they were younger people, they were families and children, they were students. Um, it was a really interesting widespread representation of sentiment in Japan. Um, the legislation did pass the diet because Mr. Abe's party uh, had a majority, uh, but it was, a, it was a real reminder, I think, to Japanese political leaders that they are not ready to fundamentally move away from Article 9 or to move away uh, from the idea that the, the military needs to be a restrained instrument at best for the Japanese state. So uh, William Dibble is asking a question about Japan's indigenous defense industry, and, and they've, they've got a very 
sophisticated uh, military program in terms of the equipment that they can produce. They are technologically very superior to a lot of other companies, countries. So how does that compare to China in terms of in technology and how important is the indigenous fifth generation fighter aircraft to the JASDF? Um, there's apparently been some internal debate recording, re regarding Japan's acquisition of the F-35 and the Navy's plan to potentially operate um, the VTOL model as a strike aircraft. Uh, what, what's the public reaction to this? So William, a lot of questions in there. I'll try and do it justice. Um, I threw them clearly. all in. <laughs> clearly you've been following this very closely. So, um, so the Jap for, for others who may not have been following as closely as William, the Japanese uh, uh, defense industry is not structured the same way ours is. So the Japanese defense contractors are also largely civilian industries as well. So you have, uh, there's been, there's some exceptions in the shipbuilding industry in particular, um, does a lot of uh, Japanese construction or uh, building for the Japanese Navy. Um, you also find our electronics firms, uh, absolutely crucial to uh, new weapon systems. They have been working closely with American contractors for some time, but they are usually not wholesale defense industries, right? They are civilian industries that have a defense component and that profitability is a smaller share of their business. Um, under Mr. Abe, the Japanese government made a very significant shift uh, in, along with the constitution to say that we are now, uh, the Ministry of Defense is now going to begin to leverage some of Japanese technology and the technological prowess for military purposes. A new agency was created within the Ministry of Defense it's called the, the ATLA, and uh, they did two things. They began to talk to other countries about how Japan's defense industry might be able to sell or produce products uh, for overseas. And again, not anywhere near the scale of today's global weapons suppliers, the United States, Russia, France, et cetera, not anywhere on that scale, but it, is a, it was lifting a very significant barrier um, for the defense industry in Japan. Now, some Japanese companies were uncomfortable with this, but you now see Japanese companies every year at defense, global defense uh, fairs and things like that. Um, the second thing that's important to remember is, or the, what ATLA was also focused on is for the first time offering researchers, technologi technological centers in universities around Japan, grants to develop certain kinds of uh, technologies that would have military applications. Again, the broader resistance in Japan to the idea of J the Japanese state becoming a military power uh, has largely precluded university-based researchers from doing contracts with the state or with the government on defense-related industries, and that's a new piece as well. Last piece is your question about uh, what Japanese produces indigenously and in the next generation fighter. So, Largely, foreign mil military sales has been the way that the Japanese uh, have purchased frontline fighter uh, aircraft from the United States. Mm -hmm. um, a year or two ago, under the Trump administration, the Japanese purchased 104 uh, F-35s. Uh, of that, a proportion of that is the, uh, the vertical takeoff and lift, um, mm -hmm. the smaller jet that would be able to be deployed on aircraft or in small short runways. Japan has a lot of small short runways, by the way, in those southern southwestern islands. So not all of the F-35Bs would be dedicated to an, a maritime presence. And in, in fact, most of them wouldn't be. But accompanying that, um, there's two pieces of the puzzle for the technology side. One is that the factory production, the licensed production uh, line that was at managed by Mitsubishi Heavy uh, was not going to produce the F-35. All of the F-35s were gonna come off the shelf from the United States, from Lockheed Martin in the United States. So that fed to, that That obviously was part of what President Trump was trying to accomplish is to get American jobs uh, engaged in the production for sale to Japan. The second piece is there's a support fighter that the Japanese now need, not their frontline strike, but their, their support fighter. And that fighter today is going to be produced largely by Japanese, under Japanese direction, employing some of the technological uh, capabilities that the Japanese industry brings to bear, but also in conjunction with others as well. And there's a big question here about whether it'll be an American company that, that joins the Japanese-led 
team or it'll be a different a European company, right? Uh, but that's currently under consideration at the moment. So lots, lots at play here. Uh, but major weapon systems uh, now for the Japanese need to be part of their investment if they're going to continue to stay ahead of the technological curve. So uh, another anonymous uh, listener has asked it, if the U.S. were to actually go to war with either China or North Korea, what could Japan contribute to that? So, uh, that, there's a long list of things, um, but let's just start in the North Korean example, because I think depending on how you imagine conflict and it would be imagined very differently for those two powers, North mm -hmm. Korea and China. Definitely. So let's, yeah, um, let's start with North Korea, because it's the one that our defense planners have imagined repeatedly, because it is the, it is the contingency in Northeast Asia where the use of force is most likely, right? Uh, and has been for since the 1950s, by the way. It's it not has just been, yeah. all about Kim Jong-un. Um, but uh, good, we have a map. I always love maps when we talk about things like that. <laughs> so the first thing Japanese contribute, of course, is the Japanese have, um, I can't remember the exact number at the moment because there's many of them, that they have a significant number of installations and facilities that house uh, U.S. forces. They also have a number of bases that are self, largely self-defense force bases, but they are also dual use UN bases. And remember that if we were to have a war on the Korean Peninsula, it would be a United Nations command um, conflict, right? Because there's still a ceasefire in, in effect on the Korean Peninsula. So it wouldn't be a US North Korea war, it would be a United Nations organized uh, command organized conflict. Japan therefore contributes significantly in the capacity to upload and surge. Uh, both by forces that are stored in Japan proper on bases, particularly in Okinawa, um, and also by the airfields and other kinds of facilities that would be made available to a UN command operation. It would also be those same facilities and the Japanese self-defense forces would also be the primary support for non-combatant uh, evacuation, uh, evacuation of the peninsula should war erupt. We often don't think about that because Planners have to think about that, but those of us in the general public don't. Um, but any kind of non-combatant evacuation, that would be Americans, Japanese, Australians, Thais, Vietnamese, Chinese now, there's millions of Chinese, or at least over a million Chinese on the peninsula. You would, in a state of war, you would be evacuating a significant amount of civilians, and that would largely be through the courtesy of Japanese facilities and the Japanese military itself. Two big things for the Korean Peninsula. Um, but what we have, what the United States has deployed in Japan is, is, is key. And so Kadena Air Force Base, Yokota Air Force Base, that's where our, our bombers go. That's where our strike force goes. Uh, there are considerable um, facilities there that we would need should we engage in a conflict with North Korea. I could go on and talk about a host of other things, but let's shift really quickly uh, for the sake of time to China. Um, the Chinese conflict is a whole other story and that map that shows us uh, China and Japan might be a good one to show at this point in time. Um, merit the, I think we need a map of, of with China um, if we could get that back up, maybe the, the Ministry of Defense map at the beginning would be helpful here. Um, but China is huge, right? So that, that this, this is a far greater scale. Uh, it would be a far different adversary. It is a, it is a seasoned or it is a mature nuclear power. Uh, it is also capable of operating now in air and maritime capacities far beyond what it could a decade or a decade and a half ago. Um, for those of you familiar with Chinese strategy, the, the idea here is to push the United States back beyond the first island chain, which is the reference here to the outlying islands. First island chain in shorthand is Japan. <laughs> and if you go further south than we have on this map, it would be the Philippines, right? So the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea are all seas that the Chinese military have declared their intention of uh, developing superior air superiority and maritime superiority. Um, that pushes right up against Japan. Uh, if we have a conflict, then our 50,000 forces that are stationed in Japan uh, would be uh, subject, subject to that threat from China. Um, Japan 
would be seriously at threat. Um, the Southwest Islands, everybody assumes that the Chinese would want to neutralize those Southwest Islands, which in, in more plain language is Okinawa, and all of the islands that kind of go from the middle quadrant of that all the way south towards the Philippines and Taiwan, of course, you can all see Taiwan is down there. Um, in any conflict, I think we can anticipate that the Chinese would want Taiwan and the Southwestern Islands to be under their control. But you, because they would want to make sure that they had adequate egress out into the Western Pacific to be able to conduct the war. Now, the Chinese, as everybody is aware, have largely focused on asymmetrical capabilities, which is capabilities that could take out our satellites. Um, so they're anti-satellite weapons, uh, uh, weapons on their ships that could take out our ships, uh, designed specifically to hobble our Navy, uh, cyber capabilities, of course, that we've all read in sort of fictional yeah. narrative forms about what that conflict could look like. Um, so I think it's hard to imagine a whole all-out China, U.S.-China war, um, but just take a good look at the physical space that Japan occupies, and Japan would very clearly be on the front line. Our bases would be neutralized, which means that Japanese territory would be attacked. It's a grim prospect, but without our presence in Japan, we would not be able to, to fight, especially in the early days of that war. Let's hope that doesn't happen. So given China's uh, situation as a nuclear power, and given Japan's sophisticated nuclear energy industry, how long do you think it would take if Japan would make the decision, and obviously it would be a huge revision of Article 9, to develop a nuclear weapon? So let me take the Article 9 question first, because that's something that lots of people say, oh, they'd have to rever revise Article 9 uh, to be a nuclear power. Uh, Japan has developed one of the largest and most technologically savvy militaries in the world without ever touching Article 9. Um, so I'm not sure we should be looking at the constitutional revision issue as an indicator on the nuclear question. Uh, you can go back to the 50s. Um, I just wrote an essay for uh, the Columbia Law Jour uh, Journal of Asian Law, along with uh, several other uh, distinguished Japan experts on the Constitution. But I, really, I went back and looked at the 1950s debate in the Diet. The, the government did not preclude the option of nuclear weapons. They didn't say straight out that Article 9 would prevent us from developing nuclear weapons. And that, that has always been a, a subterranean part of the, the Japanese policymakers' thinking is um, Japan has, as you said, a sophisticated nuclear scientists, right? They have sophisticated capability. They have plutonium and, and, and other capabilities as well. Um, so the question of how fast could Japan do it? I am not a nuclear physicist and I, so I can't speak to the technical side. People who do, and these are located largely in the Monterey Institute and other uh, non-proliferation uh, special, specialists. They basically say six to nine months would be a reasonable assumption. Now, I don't know if that assumption still holds post Fukushima, but I think it's a reasonable uh, expert opinion that it would not take long. Um, but the political variables I can talk about with more confidence. Um, I think it would, uh, it would not be something that Japan would announce and then begin. I think we would have like we almost had in the 70s with South Korea uh, and other countries uh, have gone along this path, thinking here of South Asia, I think it would develop and then it would be announced. Um, the factors that would prompt Japan to move in that direction, one of them is what I conclude in the book and I alluded to earlier is the lack of a US uh, role in nuclear deterrence. So if we gave up and you know, abandoned the treaty or said we're no longer interested or the Japanese really felt like we would not use our nuclear weapons on their behalf, uh, then that's one factor. But there are other variables and that would be the scientists themselves. If they would be willing to contribute to a state run weapons, nuclear weapons mm -hmm. program. And I think that's a big if. Uh, when, and I'm not saying that to be critical or to be uh, anything about the Japanese scientific community. The, the scientific expertise is certainly there. But the decision to mobilize a military weapons program may or may not attract cooperation by that, by that community. And so I think that's a, that's a variable. The Japanese public clearly and the polit political uh, assessment of what the Japanese, how the Japanese public would respond, another variable. Very complicated, not easy to read. 
Uh, I don't think there'll be a referendum on should we get nuclear weapons, but I think we should pay attention to how public the debate about uh, the option of nuclear weapons becomes in Japan. To date, even with all the concern about President Trump's statements and, and uh, rhetoric, uh, you don't see political parties advocating for nuclear capability, and, whereas you do in South Korea, right? Um, so I think we don't see yet an advocacy role for political leaders on the nuclear question in Japan. So that would be another variable I'd pay attention to. And then finally, I think you have to think about what the acquisition of nuclear capability would communicate to the rest of the region. I think that's a last resort for Japan. I think it will be done reactively, not aggressively. It will be done because everybody else has capabilities and Japan wants to have a force to frap or you know, the de Gaulle kind of notion that its independence depends on nuclear capability, not its war fighting uh, opportunities, but that it has no choice but to get that capability to deter aggression against them. So you mentioned Fukushima. Um, we, uh, we in Dallas have a very good friend, uh, Admiral Pat Walsh, who was <clears throat> very important to uh, the US and to the Japanese after the Fukushima disaster. And he's basically considered a superhero is our understanding. Uh, your book, you did a lot of interviews with people. Did their attitudes change after Fukushima toward the US? So first of all, Admiral Walsh is a hero and uh, deserves to be celebrated not only in Japan, but here in the United States as well. It is exactly, it's exactly the kind of leadership that we look to in our military. And it, it, he, he had the opportunity to demonstrate what good leadership and sound alliance management really looks like. So thank you, Admiral Walsh. Um, so I can't say that Fukushima changed Japanese thinking about their military power or, um, or the alliance for that matter, because Japanese had largely before the 2011 earthquake and tsunami had largely been supportive of the US military, uh, continued presence on Japanese soil, and obviously of the US-Japan alliance writ large, you know, the, the, the relationship that's been developed over a half a century or more now. Um, and so you have a very close relationship between the Japanese people and our military today, even in Okinawa, where, as you know, there's some anti-base sentiment there about mm -hmm. their role in supporting that presence. It's not a presence, it's not an anti-US military uh, critique. It's a critique of their own government's management of the bases. Um, so you have a broad, you had a broad public support uh, opinion. Um, public opinion was very much in support of the alliance before Fukushima. I think what was amazing to watch is that pub the public did two things is um, I, I, I still go and I did not wear the uniform and I did not participate in government, but I can still go to Japan and speak in, the pu in a public uh, venue and have somebody uh, stand up in the audience to thank uh, the United States and the United States um, nice. public, right, for the help that they received. So huge well, um, wellspring of gratitude across the board for the United States and their help at that time. The second is that Japanese public opinion also shifted on the self-defense forces. So with the support of our military, the self-defense forces were able to deploy quickly. Uh, they were able to sustain uh, a search and rescue operation. And again, after the tsunami, and then they were able to play with alongside our forces, a very critical role uh, in the management of the meltdown at, at, at Fukushima. Um, but the Japanese public uh, really saw their first respond this, their self defense forces as a critical uh, group of first responders. When you had public opinion polling at the time, um, or within shortly after the disaster had passed, uh, the self defense forces came out on top of who do you think uh, was the most competent? Who do you think uh, you are? Who are you most grateful to in terms of the government response? So the self defense forces themselves did themselves proud. Um, and I think on Twitter, on social media, during and throughout the crisis, uh, you could see a real personal outpouring of support for the Japanese military and their willingness to take on the very, very difficult task uh, of search and rescue and then the nuclear challenge itself. Switching a little bit to the politics, uh, the prime minister's term ends in 2021. Do you think he will be extended or will there be a new prime minister <laughs> And if there is a successor, how closely would he or she be likely to follow Abe's military policy uh, 
and his, his, his interest in reform. So I think COVID-19 has shifted uh, that, the, the ability of all of us to, to think through the post-Abe era. Um, like any other national leader, uh, Mr. Abe is going to be judged uh, on the basis of his uh, response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, it's just the moment we're in, and I think that's the reality. I think the narrative coming into 2020 before the novel coronavirus was that the Olympics would be a grand uh, success. It would give the Japanese economy the boost it critically needed. It would demonstrate Japanese technological and social prowess and skills. It would be a grand celebration uh, of Japan, much needed uh, global celebration of Japan. And Mr. Abe would come out of the summer uh, and possibly the LDP would decide that they would have a general election prior to the actual ending of his term. Um, and then he would pass the baton to any number of, of next leaders for the, the leadership of his party, the Liberal Democrats. That was the narrative, and that was a pretty you know, well set up story of, of 2020 for Abe and his party. Um, but the COVID-19 has obviously derailed that. So now the Olympics are postponed till the summer of 2021. Uh, which means to me that I suspect that should Mr. Uh, you know, should Mr. Abe come out of the current crisis with COVID-19 uh, reasonably okay, um, then he will continue to be in office through to the end of his, his, his official term, which is 2021. There will be a lower house election after that. But COVID-19, um, Laurie, as you know, uh, is tied, the political fortunes of all kinds of national leaders and even governors are now tied to their competency in the management of this virus and the public perception of that in Japan, of Mr. Abe in Japan today has, has been shaken quite a bit. His, his support uh, rating has taken a, a pretty steep dive, somewhere around 9%, depending on which public opinion poll you look at. So I, I think all bets are off. The narrative for 20, the celebratory narrative is off the table. Mr. Abe's future, not so sure. Speaking of COVID-19, how has the government in Japan reacted to, what, what kind of restrictions have they levied? What, what's the, their reaction been? So I, I'll try not to make it a long story because I realize we're, we're, sh we're short on time, but I, um, so Japan's initial response was, was really shaped by several factors, right? Was um, the China, you know, the deep interdependence between Japan and China. Uh, the first four cases in January were all people who had direct, uh, had traveled to Wuhan, had very, you know, contact tracing, you knew exactly why they were sick. Um, but then there was the second variable, which was, uh, the fluke of the arrival of the Diamond Princess in Yokohama, which was the cruise ship that many countries did not want to see uh, arrive. And wow. Japan accepted it in Yokohama and it, it was already on board. Of course, one, pa one passenger in Hong Kong had tested positive for the virus. So there was deep concern. And as we saw in real time, uh, hundreds of people uh, contracted the disease on that ship while the quarantine was being worked through in uh, offshore Japan. Um, and then the last piece of the puzzle was the, <laughs> the, the impending Olympics. And a lot of people in the media, and I think this is not actually accurate, but a lot of people have assigned Mr. Abe blame for not taking a more forthright stance because he was wanting to have the Olympics. Now, the Olympics were a huge part of Japan's economic investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, of course, the Olympic decision had brutal consequences for the Japanese economy, both in terms of expenses already, investments already made for the hosting, but also in the anticipation of the arrival of, of, of hundreds of thousands of people to Japan. But I think it's unfair to Abe to say the Olympics uh, skewed all of his decision making. Now, I could be proven wrong later when there's an investigative, uh, you know, council of the inner discussion in the cabinet and such. But um, the early uh, response was really guided by Japan's infectious disease experts at the Ministry of, of, of Health. They were, took what was known as a cluster strategy. They identified patients, they did you know, intense contract tracing. Uh, there was an outbreak beyond the Diamond Princess, of course, there was an outbreak up in Hokkaido. Hokkaido, as many of you know, is a pretty popular destination for skiing in February, January and February, by not only Japanese, but also by foreign uh, tourists. So 
<laughs> excuse me. So there's been these uh, little pockets of outbreaks and the cluster strategy uh, was very similar to what the South Koreans did in Daegu and other places, but with far smaller numbers of people being infected. The criticism of the strategy comes from testing. And Japan had the capability to test far more broadly, but didn't. Uh, again, very, very focused on these clusters of the outbreak. What you started to see in March was the numbers starting to tick up and the community transmission, as we all know, uh, took over and it took over in Japanese urban centers, particularly noticeable in, in Tokyo. So you've seen the government change, shift gears now, and Japan has a, a, a national emergency. A new law had to be passed. Mr. Abe uh, declared that seven prefectures, so it was largely Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka, and then the suburban sort of feeder prefectures around Tokyo and, and Osaka. Um, other, other governors wanted in, they wanted to be part of that national emergency, that lockdown strategy. Uh, and so late, late uh, in the week, uh, Mr., uh, over the weekend, Mr. Abe declared that the whole country was under national uh, emergency status. Um, there's been a stimulus package. Uh, to give you the caseload as of today, it's uh, still, you know, for Americans, this will sound like a very small number, although for Japan, it has rapidly increased. There's uh, around 8,500. Uh, known cases today, confirmed cases. Of that, about 26, 2700 are in Tokyo. So about somewhere between 30 and 33% of these cases are Tokyo, uh, are for Tokyo residents. So that's a, that's a deep concern. Japan has to worry the same as all of us. We have has to worry about ICU beds and bed availability, in particular in its urban centers, its medical facilities are far, far less today than they were a couple of decades ago. Uh, so there's capacity concern, real capacity concern and, and anecdotal stories coming out of Tokyo reveal that, you know, ambulances are taking patients far away from downtown Tokyo uh, because they can't find uh, beds. So they have all of the problems that we're all talking about, whether we're in Europe and in, in the United States. Uh, but the, the numbers remember, remain below the numbers of South Korea. They're still low. If you look at that chart that we've all looked at on the Financial Times with mm -hmm. the colored lines by country, Japan is oh, yeah. accelerating, but still at the lower end in terms of, of absolute numbers. But the challenge for Abe is, again, like everywhere else, is containing the health risk. Uh, and also balancing the economic consequences of a, of a, of a national lockdown. Um, he, right after the national emergency was initially announced, he also uh, announced a stimulus package of 108 trillion yen. Uh, to give you a sense of the scope of that, that's about 20% the size of the Japanese economy, uh, the actual uh, Japanese economic performance every year. Um, Lots of, you know, there's money that are going to households, about $930 payments to every Japanese, uh, working Japanese. And then there's uh, significant debt loans and subsidies for small, medium-sized businesses, um, all kinds of the package, elements of the package that you'd see in any other country's stimulus. One thing did stand out, and it's gotten quite a bit of headline attention, and that is $2.2 billion worth of subsidies for Japanese companies in, in China that have expressed an interest in relocating, uh, leaving China. And that, I think, was demand-driven. I don't think that's a strategic decision by Mr. Abe to get Japanese business out of China. I think by February, you were seeing uh, surveys of, there's about 2,600 or so Japanese companies in, doing business operating in China. And uh, informal surveys at the time uh, in February started to see about 30, 35% of those companies wanting to come home. So that piece of the stimulus package, I believe, and again, I, I am happy to be proven wrong, but I think it's, it's less about strategy and more about demand for help from Japanese private sector. So you're starting to see economic risk shift uh, as a result of COVID-19 as well. And, Japan's global companies. So that feeds into a question from Mike Dietz, someone I know well from NDIA, mm -hmm. is one of the, I think, positive things that has come out of COVID, if there's anything positive, is that countries like the US and Western Europe are waking up and realizing just how dependent we are on China for things that, like pharmaceuticals, like things we shouldn't be dependent on China. Has Japan had that same awakening? Because they've got a tremendous interdependence with China as well. 
So they do, they have a broad economic interdependence um, with China, um, but I'm not sure their pharmaceutical industry is as dependent as perhaps ours and others, right? So I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on Japanese medical, the medical industry, and so I, I, ha I, I can't really give you a good sense of what I think is gonna happen there. But I do think that, um, I think as all of us come out of this, or at least as we extend our experience with COVID-19, um, the awareness of the need for medical public health, uh, you know, sustainability, I think is going to be very acute. And I think you'll see it in Europe, you'll see it here, you'll see it in Japan, um, that reliance on China or any other country for that matter, right? Uh, for the basic needs of masks and PPEs and medicines and antivirals, I think there's going to be a real surge in, in investment to make sure, if not by the government, uh, by the private sectors, by the government as perhaps by the government as well as a national security priority. Um, one thing I will say that the Japanese have uh, worked pretty closely with the Chinese government on their antiviral medicine. I think it's called Abigan. Um, and the Chinese government approved it even before it's been approved for, for use for COVID-19 in Japan itself. So there are places I think where you might see coordination, uh, joint research, you might see um, much more, a, a le more benign uh, way of, of working with China rather than a closing up the drawbridges and you know, ending all kind of, of supply chain dynamics. But in the medical field, I expect that there will be a, a pretty high priority on indigenizing in, in nationalizing any kind of production capability, not just Japan, but other places as well. So uh, a question from Tristan Norman, which totally changes the topic from mm -hmm. COVID to climate change. How do, how do the challenges facing Japan from climate change in the Asian region impact their security policy and the role of the Japanese SDF? That is a great question. Um, too broad, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> two broad observations is that, you know, we, we used to associate Japan as being one of the global leaders in climate change. And you think about Kyoto, the Kyoto Conference, right? The Kyoto Protocols and the Paris Agreement. Um, today, Japan is less uh, out in front on this than they have been in the past. And that is for a couple of reasons. One is the experience in two, two, 2011, um, the Fukushima, the earthquake and the nuclear meltdown has, uh, has made Japan more cautious about its energy, its own energy supply. And as you know, some of you obviously know that the reliance on nuclear energy was to be one of the ways which Japan would increase its ability to sustain its own energy supply and not rely on outside sources quite so much. So, there, but there's, so that's had to pull back as, as nuclear energy plants have been um, stopped, halted and not restarted on the same scale. They've also been affected, the energy balance in Japan has also been affected by our shale gas revolution and the opening up of a North American market. So you're seeing the Japanese energy mix and debate over policy change quite considerably in the wake of 2011. It's also made uh, Japanese, I think, a little bit less conscious or the trade-offs with the environment and, and climate change have become less prioritized. Um, there's still investment in renewables. There's still a large push in segments of the Japanese uh, private sector for investment in renewables and, and, and environmentally sound uh, sources of energy. But I think that that national, natural disaster in 2011 shook a little bit of, of Japan's primacy or uh, focus on the environmental side. Um, how does it affect the military is a more difficult question. Of course, in, in, in the Southwestern islands, um, there is all kinds of ways in which uh, climate change will, will affect Japan. Um, to my knowledge, unlike the United States military, which has done a fairly expansive job in both research and adaptation to climate change and how it will affect the military, I don't see that when I see uh, Japanese military planning documents. Uh, I don't see it as a priority. Uh, I still th see the traditional threat perception and the shift in the region as being what the Japanese military is focused on. That being said, I don't know that it's not being considered, but I'm not seeing it as emerging as a, as a priority in the same way we saw it come out of the United States military. So we have a few minutes left. <clears throat> One of the things I'm interested in after reading your book is what do you want the readers to take away from your book? 
So anything that's useful to policymakers would be an easy answer to that. Um, you know, I wrote my dissertation decades ago, I won't say how many, it's a long time ago, uh, on this subject. And my dissertation is basically distilled into the, the chapter in the book that deals with the historical, deals with the Cold War and the development of the SDF under the Cold War. But I, I, I was, I've been at a think tank, I've been at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. through the crisis in 2010 and then 2012 between Japan and China over the Senkaku or Diaoyu, mm -hmm. as the Chinese say, the island dispute in the East China Sea. And I watched our policymakers try to grapple with this new reality that Japan and China might end up, you know, in some kind of, maybe not intentional, but inadvertent military mm -hmm. clash. Mm -hmm. And it really, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people who had long experience in Japan. So this is not a lack of Japan knowledge, but um, what, what was interesting to me is to see just, <laughs> we have deep institutionalization of the military partnership between Japan and the United States, but understanding the variables that affect Japanese decision-making is hard for our policymakers at any level, be they military leaders or people in the State Department, DOD, or our, politi our political appointees who come in and have to deal with a crisis, right? So part of my ambition for that book is to help inform policymakers of how the various aspects of Japan's military policy come together and um, to give them a historical tracking, a way of tracking the dynamics, but also understanding that in fact, Article 9 is discrete or different from threat perception about North Korea and China. They are not so intertwined as some people may think, right? Um, so that was one. I wanted our policymakers to have a better understanding of how policy in Japan is made. And especially uh, what the Japanese military is thinking and doing and uh, oper how they're operating and why. Um, and then the last piece was really in the con concluding chapter was to say, so often we make the assumption that Japan is going to go nuclear. It's inevitable. I mean, all kinds of essays were written in the 1980s that Japan's acquisition of economic power made nuclear power inevitable. That's just what states do. Well, that didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, threat perception, North Korea, China, what one of our questioners asked early on, um, is, you know, that threat's going to go up, Japan's going to acquire nuclear weapons, right? So my, my conclusion is no, threat perception has gone up considerably, both by North Korea and by China, right? Um, and Japan hasn't moved away from the fundamental commitment to limited mi military power, uh, and reliance on the United States for offensive strike for the, the strategic protection that it needs. What variable matters in terms of Japan's future is us. It's the United States. And I think Americans just don't, un don't, don't see it that way, don't understand it that way. And that's the message I want to put in sharp focus uh, as we start to debate about our alliances and what they mean to us here on this side uh, of the Pacific. For Japan, there is no plan B <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. If there's going to be a development of plan B, however, it'll be because we have motivated it and by stepping back from our alliance, by stepping back from our military to military cooperation. And I wanted people to understand that we operate across the Indo-Pacific because of our allies and especially our ability to position our forces uh, forward deployed in Japan. Our seventh fleet and our seventh fleet commanders would be the first ones to tell you this, would not project power the same mm -hmm. way without those right. bases in Japan. They would not be able to patrol uh, sea lanes effectively without the presence of our allies, Japan, Australia, mm -hmm. and others in the region. We would not, our military wouldn't be able to function as, uh, as well as it does across that region. And it is a broad swath of the globe uh, without our allies, first and foremost, Japan. So that's the other, that's the last message that I wanted to, to provide is that knit throughout the book, you can see uh, how this relationship is important, not just to Japan, but to us as well. Lori, Sheila, thank you so much for such a, a great, uh, great discussion. I don't think I've ever seen as many questions as I've, as <laughs> I I've seen I know, I couldn't get, ask them all. <laughs> and, and good questions. So uh, before uh, we, we leave our, our, our viewers and listeners, let me tell you what I got to do last night. 
one of the wonderful parts about my job is sometimes I get advanced copies of books. And uh, yesterday uh, I started reading, I guess about 9 p.m. or so, Lawrence Wright's new book, The End of October. Mm -hmm. It is a medical thriller. I don't know how Larry does this, <laughs> but it really does predict what is happening now. And uh, I didn't get much sleep last night, <laughs> but I am really looking forward to the opportunity for all of you to talk with Larry Wright. And that's going to be Tuesday, May 12th at 4 p.m. Uh, if you've missed some of our webinars with Sebastian Malaby or George Friedman or Dion Searcy and many others, just go to our website at dfwworld.org and you can, uh, you can access them. Uh, let me again thank our friends at interrobangbooks.com for offering all of you a discount of 15% on Sheila's book, as well as any other books that you might order uh, up through this Sunday. And uh, go to our website and see what else is coming up. And let me wish each and every one of you and your families a safe weekend. Stay well. Thanks for watching.